When you see this symbol, you know you're watching television that's educational and informational. The more you know on NBC. Hey everyone, I'm Corey Robinson. If you're looking for sports stories that inspire, motivate, and open your eyes, then this is the place to be. Welcome to One Team, the power of sports. Today, after surviving a deadly bus crash, Ryan Strausnitsky has learned to play the sport he loves in a new way. I knew I wanted to play a side of hockey and I knew I wanted to crack a spot on the Paralympic team. Then, Team USA's Dr. Angel Brutus talks to me about how a focus on mental health is helping athletes improve their game. Mental health is physical health. They are one and the same. You can't function without having some kind of capacity from a mental standpoint. And later, we look at the life of Peggy Kirk Bell, whose golf legacy extends well beyond the 18th hole. The hockey community came to a standstill in 2018 after the Humboldt Broncos, a junior team in Canada, lost 10 teammates and their coach after a fatal bus crash. Those who survived the accident had severe injuries and faced long rehabilitations. But one of those survivors, Brian Strausnitsky, was determined to not let anything keep him from returning to the ring. I first got into hockey when I was about four years old. Uh, my dad got me into the sport. So at the age of 16, I moved away uh, to go play midget AAA hockey and try and pursue my career that way to make the jump to Junior A. And on uh, my 17-year-old year, I ended up playing a little bit of Junior A hockey. And then obviously I got traded to Humboldt that year and we, we had a good season. I, I developed as a person and I developed as a hockey player as well. The, the coach out in Humboldt cared more about the person you were versus the hockey player you were. And he, he kind of instilled that in all of us as being a good person around the community and always giving back. And that's something I'll always remember and something I cherish, cherish with me today. When I was in Humboldt and the accident happened, I remember the, you know, the day I remember it happening. All of a sudden, the bus driver kind of screams and I, I poke my head around down the aisle and sure enough, there's a semi truck coming this way. And, you know, the initial collision happens and everything's sort of black. I remember how much long after I gained consciousness, but I remember kind of sitting up with my back against the semi truck kind of looking around at all the mayhem, trying to collect my thoughts, trying to understand what just happened. So I go to move and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not moving, I'm stuck under something. So I go to look at my legs and, you know, they're just not moving and there's nothing on top of them. So instantly something wrong is happening. That's when the adrenaline starts kicking in. I couldn't really speak, I had head trauma. It was just hard for me to try and get help. And I kind of basically it was just a waiting game. It's one of those things where Unless you experience it, you don't understand the feeling of, am I going to live or am I going to die in this situation? So for me, it was just a waiting game. And luckily enough, someone came to help, got loaded off into the ambulance, and you know, away went all the, uh, the rehab, the, the surgeries, all the things I had to go through. There have been times where I was immobilized. I couldn't move unless a nurse brought in a giant crane and lifted me out of bed just to get into a wheelchair to go do therapy something that I've experienced and I'm still trying to work through, but I feel like if you can overcome that, if you can get past little challenges every day, it's something as simple as getting out of bed every day. That's what I had to learn in the hospital. As parents, it's heartbreaking. It's just, the whole thing was heartbreaking anyway, but just to try and see your child struggle to do the simplest tasks, that was hard. But uh, he, he, he proved me wrong. <laughs> he proved everybody wrong. So. Things like that weigh down on you is like, oh, I'm, I can't do this. I can't, I can't, I can't. And as soon as you make a statement, that's the end. That's what your mind's gonna think. But if you leave it open, if you leave it like a question, how can I do this? I'm gonna do this, you know? Sort of positive talk to yourself. That's when you obtain the, the highest goals. Well, shortly after the accident, I understood the extent of my injuries. I knew that stand-up hockey might not be an option anymore. And just around the same time, Canada lost in the Paralympics to the Americans. Yeah, he woke up, he's all groggy, and he looked and he goes, hey dad, hey mom, hey buddy. And then he kind of went in and out a little bit, and then he goes, who won the Olympics in uh, sled hockey? Canada lost 2-1 to the States. Huh, and then he goes, I think that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna play sled hockey and try and win Canada the gold. 
And I looked at Michelle, and then I looked at him. I went, okay, it starts today. There's so many avenues you can take, and there's so many people that just kind of curl up and, and decide to give up. But I think no matter if you're still breathing, you still have an opportunity to get a chance back at life in whatever avenue you want to go down. So for me, that was hockey was always a safe haven. And I knew that's where I wanted to be, it was on the rink. It's the most equalizing opportunity for everyone out there. And again, at the end of the day, it's just about having fun. I knew I wanted to play a slide of hockey and I knew I wanted to crack a spot on the Paralympic team. When we return, Ryan's love of hockey has given him a new goal to shoot for. Then, Dr. Angel Brutus stops by to shed some light on the mental pitfalls athletes face on game day and in everyday life. We'll be right back to The More You Know on NBC. We now return to The More You Know on NBC. After surviving a horrific crash, Ryan Strasnitsky lost the use of his legs and realized that he may never wear a pair of skates again. But that doesn't mean he's given up on playing the sport he loves. Sled hockey is just hockey, but played in a different style. There's the same amount of players, same rules. The only difference is you can't really trip someone that's already sitting. So once they understand how aggressive and hard the sport is and how fun it can be, I think then they'll start having an appreciation for it. That's how we can grow the game. And part of my goal, aside from you know rehab and, and trying to crack a Paralympic team, is to grow the sport as well. But as soon as you get into the sled hockey community, everyone has their own story. There's amputees, there's paras, there's people with a CP, cerebral palsy. And for them to be all on the ice in the same arena, playing the same game, being all equal out there, really the only disability you can have is a bad attitude. As soon as Ryan got on that ice, the smile was like he was reborn again. And that's one of the most eye-opening things is that nobody's complaining. Again, everyone's just smiling, having fun, playing the sport they love. It's difficult to get into sled hockey. It's one of the hardest things because even after my accident, I had no idea where to start. I was lucky enough to have my coach and mentor, Chris Cedarstrand, who played on the national team, live around where I live. And he, you know, was helpful right away from the start. He's turned something that was horrible, you know, into just a, a footnote in his story of life now. I think hockey teaches you every life lesson available. That's about perseverance, leadership qualities, uh, how you interact with your teammates, how strong your willpower is, things you can sort of apply to regular life and outside of hockey, school, work, whatever it is, you can apply those qualities that you learn from hockey and being a good person in the community as well. Learning to handle yourself professionally at a young age, learning how to handle adversity, how to knock it in your own head when you're down a couple goals. It's just about teaching you those life lessons that'll get carried on through generations, passing it down. Without sport, I wouldn't be the person I am today and really grateful that I got to play for 18 years and I'm really excited that I got to play sled hockey for the next, you know, however many years and it's just about having fun. And if you can have fun at the end of the day, then that's what sport's all about. Ryan is still training on the ice, hoping to represent Canada in the Paralympics one day. Coming up, Dr. Angel Brutus joins us in the huddle. And later, we honor the great Peggy Kirk Bell, whose groundbreaking work in golf has left an enduring legacy. But first, sports moments you have to see to believe. It's the replays of the day. We'll be right back to the more you know on NBC. We now return to the more you know on NBC. Scouring the internet for all the best plays in sports takes a lot of work. That's why we do it for you. Check out some of the sports world's best in the replays of the day. This kid is making his way from the kitchen to the Olympics. Nice job, huh? And this curling fan is practicing to coach the team. Athletes often talk about the physical preparation it takes to be the best, but focus on mental health is just as important. That's why I spoke to Dr. Angel Brutus, the lead mental health provider of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Angel Brutus in the huddle, the lead mental health provider for um, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And I just want to just start at the very beginning, Angel. Mm -hmm. Why is mental health so important for athletes? 
you just asked the like golden question. Uh, this is definitely my lane. Uh, mental health is definitely right along the lines of physical health. Actually, a tagline that I tend to use quite frequently is that mental health is physical health. They are one and the same. You can't function without having some kind of capacity from a mental standpoint. The behaviors that you demonstrate, the movements that you make, those things are connected to your thoughts, right? And so it's very much so intricately interwoven with one another. Do athletes at the current moment see mental health and physical health as one and the same as, as you see it, or is there still a gap? We're getting there, right? And so that's the fun part about it, right? So even working with athletes who really are the experts in what they do, it's always fascinating to get to the basics and the messaging that really just makes sense. And so when you're working with someone and you see that light bulb goes off and it really is a true sentiment, and, and when they realize that, that actually gives you a little bit more sense of control and a sense of agency, right? Because now you really are in the driver's seat. How can mental health help you be more successful as an athlete? When you think about performance and you think about top performance, it's important to realize the more that you have self-awareness, the more that you're able to recognize your own patterns, the more that you're able to anticipate how you're going to respond to certain situations and what better place to do that in an athletic atmosphere, right? And so that's how it definitely promotes the ability to enhance your performance over time. What are some of the biggest challenges that athletes have come to you with? There are times when athletes feel that, that sense of internalized pressure to perform as well as possible for fear of disappointing others, right? And so oftentimes, we know that families invest a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of other resources to assist and support athletes throughout their sport career. And there's a level of desire to please those individuals and to not disappoint. And so that becomes an added pressure. And if not careful, an athlete can actually walk around with a sense of burdensomeness if this doesn't work out, right? And that's not a way to live. I, I see the Olympic rings on your, on your shirt. And I think, you know, it's everyone's dream to be associated <laughs> with the Olympic team. Yeah. So for all the kids out there who want to follow your footsteps, mm. you know, how do they, how, what's the first step? How do they get started? Oh my gosh, stay curious reach out to individuals who do this work. You would be surprised how many professionals are willing to take time out of their day to have a conversation. Mentorship is literally the backbone of this particular field. We can't do it alone. And really, honestly, there are a couple of times that I, I do speaking engagements and I always say, we're always planting seeds for trees where we probably will never benefit from its shade. So it's really all about leaving a legacy for up and coming practitioners who are really interested and passionate about doing the work because it's needed. That's beautiful imagery. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Bruges, for joining yeah. us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited for the kids who are going to be watching this because I hope there's something that they glean from it that takes, a long, takes them a long way. After the break, we reflect on the life of Peggy Kirk Bell, who paved the way for generations of golf pros. We'll be right back to The More You Know on NBC. We now return to The More You Know on NBC. When Peggy Kirk Bell first picked up a golf club in 1938, no one could have predicted how important that decision would be. Now, more than 80 years later, it's clear that the game of golf is much better off, thanks to her. Peggy Kirk was born in Finley, Ohio, a natural athlete. She excelled at most mainstream sports, but she didn't find golf until she was in her late teens. My mom says, I want to try this golf. So she goes out 15 minutes and she comes in to the pro shop and she goes, I've lost all three of my balls and I didn't even make it to the end of a hole. She didn't know it was called a green. And the pro said, do you really want to learn this game? And she goes, well, yeah. In spite of the inauspicious start, Peggy Kirk figured it out. She won three state championships after that. In 1949, she won the North and South. That same year, she won the title holders at Augusta Country Club. It was one of their four majors at the time. This is the Golf Union of Ireland scarf that she had when she was in a Curtis Cup. They were given this scarf, one of my favorite, but it matched my outfit today. Playing for the United States Curtis Cup, to me, was the big, biggest thing in my life. As her career and schedule were taking off, Peggy Kirk learned to fly. 
She had this infectious, wonderful, larger-than-life approach to the game. She was kind of the every woman of golf, just like Arnold was the every man of golf. Her and Artie became great friends just because of their love of flying. I didn't like driving across the country, and so I got an airplane. Can you imagine flying your own airplane in the late 50s and early 60s? Not surprisingly, she was also one of the original female professionals. She's not listed as one of the founders of the LPGA, but she was right there, and she, within, I think, a year, joined. So she really is the extra founding mother of the LPGA Tour. In addition to the LPGA, Peggy Kirk found Warren Bullet Bell, also from Finley, Ohio, who played professional basketball for the Fort Wayne Pistons. Mom was in town and drove up to a stop sign in a convertible. My dad happened to be standing on the corner and recognized her and said, hey, Peg Kirk, I hear you're a hot shot golfer. Why don't we play and whoever loses has to buy dinner. Of course, Mom beat him, but was a sure date regardless. He wrote her a letter and said, I know if I buy you a golf course, you'll marry me. So that's how they ended up here. And we're thrilled because we love this area. In the early 60s, Peggy Kirk Bell created her Golfaris, an instruction getaway designed by a woman for women. There's no singular female who has brought golf to newcomers and women more than Peggy. With an emphasis on fun and over the course of six decades, Peggy Kirk Bell taught over 20,000 women to play golf and she established a girls golf tour. Although the Hall of Fame instructor left her mark on countless people and players, she wasn't just doing it as a teacher. She was a tournament host. After being the venue for elite juniors and seniors, it was Judy Bell of the USGA, no relation, who awarded Peggy Kirk Bell the first of many major championships. You know, anytime you host a United States Golf Association event, it's a great honor and thrill for us. Pine Needles hosted the Women's U.S. Open in 1996. To be able to play the U.S. Open there, it was just the coolest memory to have. Back-to-back -back championships, Veronica Sorenstam. In 2001. Another back-to-back -back champion, Ari Webb. And again in 2007. And Christy Kerr has her major championship. It's through these major championships and the ongoing development of her resort that, like the root systems of all those pines, Peggy Kirk Bell's legacy continues to get deeper and more everlasting. I was approached about maybe purchasing Mid Pines. And I said, Peg, what do you think? She says, oh, we gotta get that. I love Mid Pines. One Christmas, I opened this thing and here it was, this lamp from the 50s. She says, you gotta figure out a way to do it. To this day, that lamp sits in my office and it's on 24 seven, and I think of Peg all the time. The Bell family purchased Mid Pines in 1994, Southern Pines in 2020, and since then, all three courses have been restored to something a lot closer to what Donald Ross originally designed. And this year, although she won't be there for the U.S. Women's Open, like that sweet smelling breeze, Peggy Kirk Bell will be whipping through the trees. A Couple months before she passed away, I put her to cart. And I drove around the property at Pine Needles. So I said, look at everything you and dad did. I just wanted her to know how much we appreciate the life we'd grown up with. And I thanked her for everything that she had done. And uh, she just smiled. You're proud that you're her daughter, but I'm no Peggy Kirk Bell. I don't think there's going to be anybody else like her. In her autobiography, The Gift of Golf, Peggy writes, Power was nothing without timing in golf. While she was talking about how to swing a club, the words described her career to a T. She came into the world of golf at the perfect time, and the power of her personality changed the game forever. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Wanting the Power of Sports.